Uh, good evening and a very warm welcome to the British Library, to all of you who are here in St. Pancras and to our um, uh, listeners and viewers online. A very warm welcome to all of you. I am Luisa Elena Mengoni, head of the Asian and African collections here at the British Library, and I am delighted to introduce uh, this event uh, this evening and welcome our two guests. Shah Mohammed uh, Rais and David uh, Loin, who will be in conversation this evening uh, for around 45 minutes, and then there will be um, opportunities to ask questions from the audience, as well as if you're interested to send your questions on the chat online. As a way of introduction, um, uh, I would say uh, Shah Mohammed uh, Rais is um, from Afghanistan. He um, opened his bookshop in 1974 in Kabul. And uh, the bookshop, uh, thanks for the wide range of uh, books available, uh, has become a sort of cultural um, venue and really part of the intellectual life in uh, Kabul for many, many years. It has been open for almost five decades. It is still open, and obviously it has gone through quite a number of changes, social and political changes mm -hmm. in the country. And I understand there is also an online uh, platform that still has, um, is very active and where you can purchase books. Uh, David Loin is a journalist and author and um, also a foreign uh, correspondent for the BBC, and his uh, third book, um, The Long War, The Inside Story of America and Afghanistan since 1911, was published in 2021 and will be um, available also uh, for purchase, if you like, as well as uh, Shah Mohammed Rai's book will be available for audiences here. Uh, before we start this conversation, I thought it would be interesting for you to know that the British Library has a vast and diverse collection uh, from and related to Afghanistan that is available through our uh, reading rooms. A vast number of archival resources are part of the East India Company and the India Office uh, records that cover the period from the 17th to the 20th century. From uh, the very first Anglo-Afghan relationship dated to the 17th century to the administration of the British delegation, delegation in Kabul in the mid-20th century. So it's quite a long uh, history. And these are complemented by private papers, by individuals, administrators, officials, doctors, etc., who were posted in Afghanistan, who were traveling across the country. In addition to the records, we also have the India Office Library that has uh, manuscript in uh, Persian, in Pashto, and um, with some rare and unique editions that are also a complement to the collection that originally was held at the British Museum Library, and then it came to the British Library in 1973. Um, in addition to archives and manuscripts, uh, we also have a collection of uh, prints, photographs, and drawings, uh, again, related to Afghanistan, and there are a number of uh, sketches, drawings, and photographs that were made over a number of years, again, by individuals who were uh, posted in, uh, in Afghanistan or traveling across the country. And all these resources are, uh, if you're interested, can be checked online through our collection guides, but also, of course, through the reading rooms. So if you are not a member of, uh, and a reader of the British Library, this is a good occasion to start. So without any further ado, I will now hand over to our uh, two guests. And uh, please join me in welcoming them to this evening's event. <laughs> Thank you. Very much. Well, thank you very much, Louisa. And, and uh, Louisa and her wonderful staff gave um, Shah and I a tour of, of some of the best of their uh, manuscripts, including a, an early 16th century 
illustrated manuscript of the Babu Nama, and it, uh, believe me, it's a, it's a wonderful collection, so thank you very much for that. Um, and thank you for coming this evening. Many of you will know um, George Orwell's um, Ideal Pub, the description of George Orwell's Ideal Pub, the moon underwater, um, a place that didn't actually exist. Um, I can describe to you um, a bookshop that is the ideal bookshop, that is not a fantasy, um, not in my imagination, because I've actually been there, and it's Sharem Books in, uh, in Kabul. Um, it is um, the most extraordinary sort of Aladdin's cave of, um, of books about Afghanistan, about Persia, about South Asia, um, going back, some of them going back again, well back to periods you know, covered here by the British Library, upstairs in a secret sort of hidden compartment, um, there are first editions of uh, books going back to the middle of the 19th century um, when the British explorers were going there, which are sold, which Shah sells you know, quite properly to uh, British and American visitors who can, who can manage to find them in his shop for a very large amount of money, and good for him. <laughs> um, and, then, and then through the shop, through this cavern of corridors, um, is this extraordinary collection of books, um, but including modern books in Persian and Pashto. And this is a man dedicated to the education of modern Afghanistan. I was in there once um, uh, looking through his wonderful collection of books and found um, uh, in the corridor a couple of men in turbans who were boxing up textbooks um, for schools in remote rural Helmand province in the south of the country. Um, which had been ordered by, um, by these shops. And, uh, you know, believe me, it's just a wonderful collection. Um, on the walls, there are um, uh, lots of uh, editions of stamps uh, published by the Soviets when they were there in the 1980s. There are reprinted posters, again, of, you know, the British period and of maps from, from an early time. And I defy anyone to go into that shop and, and uh, tell me there's another bookshop in the world with, with anything like the, uh, the quality. But Charles now had to leave the country. Perhaps we could talk about... Um, your personal story and the refugee life in a minute. But why don't we start with how you're running your business now? Because you're managing remarkably from a refugee life to actually keep the bookshop going. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your good words and Lisa showing me and telling me about 150 title of books <laughs> and Pashto. It was amazing for me because we have very few books on Pashto and patterns in the Pashto language uh, is the only language uh, the British has have been written, the grammar of this language. So it was amazing for me when I saw a few titles there. And uh, I started uh, my business in 1974 when I was graduated from Kabul University as a civil engineer. And my family had construction companies, and they worked uh, as a construction dealers. And they were very happy that uh, I am educated as civil engineer, and they are the contractors and uh, uh, working as a construction dealers. So a combination of uh, engineer from themselves, and they will get more money. Uh, when at first day I was introduced as engineer in Ministry of uh, Power and Electricity. Uh, they told me your salary will be 2,750 Afghanis and 500 uh, extra because you have uh, a master's degree in engineering. Because we read uh, five years, not four years as a lesson, le lessons, uh, graduate. Uh, so I thought with myself, uh, at that time it was around uh, $60 per month. I thought it's too little money for me. And my family, my uncles, uh, they said, an engineer doesn't need any salary because every item in the company is yours. You have steel, you have wood, you have uh, gravel, you have bricks, everything. I said, no. The first paragraph in my textbook, Introduction into Engineering, there was written an engineer as a scientist and a scientist is not an engineer. 
So I am a scientist, I am a wise man, wisdom, I have wisdom. But a wisdom, a man with wisdom, it's very hard to steal, to be thief of the state. So I left at the first day the engineering uh, work and started thinking what to do to establish my career. So I decided after one year to open a bookshop. And uh, during this one year, everyone came to my father and telling him that we are sorry your son is uh, mad and <laughs> lost his mental because he left such a profitable job as an engineer. And uh, so sometimes they came to my father uh, to give them his support for his sorrows and grief. <laughs> uh, so when I opened the bookshop, all my relatives become 100% uh, sure that I am really a madman. <laughs> and uh, the book business is very bad. Actually, at that time, uh, Afghanistan in the 1960s, just emerging as a modern country, because new intellectual, very honest, very good trained Afghan students studied in the United States in the 60s, and also in uh, uh, European countries in India, in Japan, they came back to Afghanistan, very talented engineers, very talented diplomats, very talented historians. Afghanistan, for a small country like Afghanistan, it was enough they have good intellectual around himself. But unfortunately, during the Dawood regime, who introduced the first republic in Afghanistan, uh, first years it was very good, the people welcomed these new changes actually, because uh, it was extraordinary, a very poor country. They introduced a republic uh, regime uh, for their people. And uh, Dawood was also very talented to work very well. Unfortunately, an illness in Afghanistan. The ethnic violence is very high. And the Pashtun tribe, they tried their domination on the whole country. They always talk about majority. Actually, it's not true, because when we are a nation, the majority and minorities uh, doesn't have a meaning in the Republic. And the uh, Republic was declined. At the last two years, uh, he has assassinated a uh, very important and patriotic Afghan intellectuals like my one wall, uh, like many others, and imprisoned them. So those intellectuals who were educated, they flew back, they started flying back uh, to the United States. And still, they remain as a professors. Uh, they have become very old nowadays, and uh, there are a number of them, you know, know them. They came and migrated to the United States and here in the United Kingdom and European countries, most of them back to the United States. And the uh, intellectual market was very bad for bookshop. But I opened another type of bookstores. When I opened this bookstore, I visited the government bookshop they had published uh, a series of books about the history, about the culture, in a very low quality book, but it was very important books. So I went to the bookshops and asked them, uh, uh, do you have books on Afghanistan, like sniffing dogs? Just everywhere I go and I sniff. I'm very surprised at myself when I go in a bookshop, I understand that that corner, probably there is a book on Afghanistan, I go in there. They said, yes, we have a series of books, uh, uh, which was uh, the bad title. You never sold a copy in five or six years. He showed me history of Tabor Shadrani, history of Ahmad Shadrani in this, this. We had 500 copies and still have 490 copies. In 10 years, we have only sold 10 days. I asked them if I buy all of them at cash how much discount you will give me. They said, uh, we will give you 80% discount if you buy it. I purchased all books from the governmental bookshops and unearthed, like mine, uh, the books from the big boxes they kept in their uh, cellars. So I brought those books in my bookshop. And Why did I, you think that if they hadn't been sold in their bookshops, they were going to be sold in yours? Because the bookstores, one by one, was closing mm -hmm. every day. And they changed their bookshops. There were very good, uh, famous bookstores uh, 
in a part of their bookshop, they sold uh, crockery, <laughs> house uh, kitchenwares and uh, another sold cameras and uh, some uh, radios. Uh, so in a sense, you were the man who brought yeah. book selling to Kabul in a modern, mm. in a modern sense. But just to go back to my first, you know, how are you able to keep it going now in 2022? I mean, that's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? Uh, now I'm much experienced and uh, I have modern facilities. My bookshop is at my pocket. Uh, in my mobile phone, I can contact my bookstore every day, every minute I contact them and uh, we have a good connection and, uh, with our customers and my sons in Canada, in Europe, my daughters, my sons in Europe, in Canada, they are supporting me, they are working, and we are- And you're able to sell people. online, I think, as well, aren't you? Yes, because uh, we have rare books, which is not available. During the coronavirus, uh, approximately every day, I published a new book, I reprinted a new book, which is not available every day. In two years, I published 650 copies, titles, of books, rare books. I uh, reprinted, reproduced uh, facsimile editions of uh, original books uh, which was available in Library of Congress. They donated a series of those books uh, and I reprinted them because it's very hard for Afghans to travel to New York, to Washington, D.C. and uh, to read those books. So it's really easy for them. They can pay a little money and have the original copy for their investigations and this. You told me an extraordinary story, and I would just share it with the, with the audience here about giving books to bus drivers to take them around the country so people can so explain how that works. Uh, it's very interesting. When I opened my sh bookshop, uh, I didn't import books from outside Afghanistan at the first years, five years. I wrote uh, banners in many places, posters in Afghanistan, in Kabul city. We buy your libraries and book, uh, books uh, pri uh, from their private libraries. So every day they brought for me a big pile of books and I was buying them at low price, a low price. And uh, after five years I found that uh, my business is going uh, uh, down and uh, it's not good. So I thought, uh, I found out that the high ranking Afghans, VIP Afghans like ministers, uh, head of the organizations, they never come to the, my bookshop here in the downtown. So I thought I went to Continental Hotel one day. I thought, let me open a bookshop here. When I opened that bookshop, it was amazing. Suddenly, I got lots of money, lots of fame, lots of uh, contacted, lots of people, diplomats, uh, even ministers uh, of foreign affairs from many countries came visiting Afghanistan. They had uh, uh, a seminar or a conference at Continental Water because it has a beautiful ballroom and a beautiful lobby uh, at the, uh, the Continental Hotel, and they came to my bookstore for a few minutes when they had a break and uh, they came to my bookstore and saw there is an extraordinary bookshop there and so it was amazing. So then uh, I, when I taught, I am the only importer of books for uh, Afghan students, uh, medical books, engineering books, books on uh, management, computer science and these things. In other large cities, there is no large bookshops. And uh, when the, those small booksellers come from mazar -e sharif or from other province to Kabul city, they charge a lot of profit to them. Uh, one thing I will tell Mr. David I say that I sell expensive things. <laughs> Books expensive, very expensive. It's true. I sold uh, to foreigners very expensive, maybe 10 times more than its ordinary price. But I explain yes. to every individual, <laughs> I explain to every individual, my foreign friends, that I subsidize books for Afghan, Afghans. They are very poor. And books is a uh, merchandised uh, trade. Uh, it needs money. The paper go, price go high. The printing cost is very high. Labor, everything. So the Afghans cannot afford to buy books. 
a large medical book price was $20, and my small book was uh, about 95 page a pocket edition was $25. So comparing with this, and uh, when someone tell me that how you become that successful best bookseller, I said because of money. I didn't steal the money from the pocket of customers, but it was my art of business that I had opportunity to sell very high. Because this huge work, when you want to do huge business, I was not supported from a country or from another organization, even from the government. I never got a penny support, but it was the money that helped me to be in this position. So, uh, so when uh, I saw this situation, I purchased a Mercedes-Benz bus, a large one, 303 model, and uh, removed the seats and installed uh, shelves on the both sides and loaded the bus with lots of books. And uh, because the compartment in the bus for luggages, uh, I put the curtains and folding discs I purchased from the market and a tent. Everywhere I traveled, I made uh, a camp there, a very large camp for there, and the, the students, I went to the compound of the university, the universities, and uh, made a camp uh, there for bo books of there, and they came, the students came and purchased their needs very, at very low price, not very high. Uh, so I was very lucky, 80% of books I have imported for Afghan students. And 20% all other booksellers. 80% most mainly I imported from UK, from United States, from India, uh, from Pakistan, from Iran, uh, from everywhere I imported books and that. And so, uh, so that, but that was the mobile um, mobile books. I, I'm mobile coming to your question. Come, yeah, because yeah. you had this very interesting relationship with bus drivers, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm coming to this. Yeah. When this uh, <laughs> when this project was failed, when this project was failed, so I gave an advertising on Facebook. At that time, Facebook and Messenger chat was in its very very. Low quality, but anyhow, I sent them that uh, message that if you want to bo buy books, you can order your books, and uh, we can send to bus uh, between two cities from Kabul to Mazar to Herat to Kandar, Helmand, even Warzun countries. There were bus services. So, so you, weren't se you weren't sending a bus, you were yeah, yeah. using the order. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought uh, they will charge me money. But when I made a 5 kg package and gave it uh, to the bus driver, usually they travel early in the morning, 4 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning, midnight in Afghanistan time. And my uh, employee went with a 5 kg to bus with a few hundred Afghanis to give the bus driver to transport this package to the students. And the student, uh, when I was very surprised. The bus driver never took the money. They were illiterate uh, drivers. They never have been to school. But they said when my man explained to them, this is for an Afghan student in Mazar Sharif, and he uh, purchased this one, can you deliver? He said, OK, I will deliver at three. It's a very small package, two or three small packages, five kgs or 10 kgs. We don't charge money. Very few cases they charge a little money, but mostly they never charge money. And then, the, and then the bus drivers would bring the money back from the uh, students yeah. when they Yeah, when, when the, they the, the bus, bus driver came to the station and the customer went to the station and picked up the package and paid the money, the price of the book to the driver, and the driver next day came to Kabul and uh, we collected the money from them. So it was very successful for a while. And when uh, we established our website, uh, so it was much easier for Afghan students to order online. And uh, even there is no credit card system in Afghanistan. Still, we have problem, lots of problems. 
uh, but uh, they pay the money to do bus drivers and help. And uh, I never uh, paid uh, charity zakat uh, of my money because I'm a rich man, very rich man, very <laughs> good. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, now I'm not rich because my account has been freeze, <laughs> frozen in Kabul and uh, my online sale goes to my bank account. And uh, anyway, uh, uh, every year I uh, send message to remote schools uh, in Afghanistan and called the school master to come to my bookshop with a letter from the Ministry of uh, Education and uh, with a team of their teachers. And I gave them $4,000 every year, $4,000 credit to select books from my vast bookshop. And it was very useful everywhere I was paying. Just last year when the Taliban came, uh, we gave to an uh, orphanage uh, shelter for uh, Afghan girls, uh, histories from different uh, languages, Pashto, Persian, Uzbeki, and it was very good for them. They purchased this work. Can I ask about the state of, I mean, lots of people here, since August the 15th last year, the fall of Kabul, the terrible shock of the, the swift fall of Kabul last year. Lots of people will have read about the closure of girls' schools and the difficulty of, of, of people in Afghanistan. And I mean, just to give you one statistic, in, in, in Afghanistan at the sort of A-level stage, at the end of, of um, high school, um, there's an exam called the Kankor, which every student in the country takes. So they can grade the entire students of, of, of Afghanistan in one year. And in the last 10 years, before the fall of, of Kabul last year, um, uh, the, the, there, were, the, the, there were a mixture of girls and boys in the top ten, and in two of the last ten years, it was girls who were at the top of the, of the Kankor list, you know, the, the most intelligent student in Afghanistan, as it were, in that year. Um, well, now, last week, the, the, the Kankor results were, um, were issued, and there isn't a single girl in the top ten, just as a sort of symbol of how you know, things have changed, you know, quite rapidly, even at that senior level. And of course, we know girls, you know, further down are not really getting proper education. I mean, can you, you know, you've been someone who has spread educational ideas in Afghanistan over the last 30, 40 years through so many wars, you know, through the Russians, the Civil War, the Taliban last time, and now the last 20 years of conflict under the mm. Americans. Um, What's it like now, I mean, in terms of, of, of getting books out, in terms of Afghan intellectual life, in terms of education? Uh, uh, the closure of uh, schools, especially for girls, uh, uh, I'm not optimistic if the Taliban uh, release and let them go to school. But uh, I don't believe they can learn anything. The uh, most important thing is that what curriculum they should provide for schools. It's very important. Uh, because and do you see that as under threat? It's very big threat. It's very big threat. If the school is closed, it's much better than the, if they open the schools with their own curriculum. Because at least now the pressure of the world is very big and high on Taliban. If they open the school and the world recognize them, because they have, and the curriculum is changed in favor of Taliban because uh, it's very horrible, very dangerous for the future of Afghanistan because uh, they actually engrave an ideology in their brain of the Afghan generation, coming generation, just the suicide bombers or just the Taliban and uh, how to pray, how to go to toilet, and which verse of the Quran you should read when going to toilet. So these things are very dangerous. It's not, uh, I'm not optimistic and I, I don't agree. Just a few months before, the head of Afghan film was weeping and crying that Taliban has closed Afghan film and we are very sorry for this. 
And I told in the show that during the million, billions of dollars coming to Afghanistan, during the democracy, you got lots of uh, what they call uh, the prize, golden prizes uh, from, well, uh, I forgot the word now, uh, uh, score, score. Uh, when they get award uh, from. Scholarship. Uh, uh, no, no. A grant. Uh, an Oscar. An Oscar. 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 An Oscar. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I said, how many Oscars you got in 20 years for Afghan film? Just they were useless. We don't have any film. They never produce a film uh, about Afghanistan. Afghanistan has lots of good things, as Mr. David Line said. They were talented. You should uh, demonstrate those, uh, those talents. And, Afghanistan has lots of misery and misfortunes. What movie did you make? And now you're crying and weeping that uh, the Taliban has closed the uh, cinema and the movie and these things. You mean they, they lost the opportunity when they had it and they didn't yeah, they, really take it? Yeah, they did nothing. And golden opportunity, yeah. And the school is the same. If they open the school for Afghan students, and uh, it's awful. It's, well, it's better to be closed. Yeah. I, um, uh, you, you said to me earlier on today, um, being a bookseller in Kabul with independent thoughts, it's very hard to survive. Mm -hmm. And you obviously decided you've been in prison by the Russians before, I think. But you were, you were in Afghanistan during the last time yeah. the Taliban were in power. This time, this time you felt you had to leave, that refugee life, all, awful as it is, was better than the life you were, you were living in Kabul. Could you talk us uh, through that yeah, sort of decision? Because, I mean, the shock of people who've lost their country, and it's hard to imagine, really. And I know some Afghans who've been transplanted twice. You know, they came to Europe last year, and then they couldn't get asylum, and then they've gone to Canada. They're moving your whole family across two continents, having lost your country. Mm -hmm. It's sort of unimaginable. Yeah. Really. I have you're still in, an yeah, you're yeah. still in an asylum hotel, I think, aren't yeah, you? Yeah. I have two wives. The people say you are two wives, which wife you love uh, most. Actually, I have three wives. And my favorite wife is the books. <laughs> and my real wives are very jealous with the books. I spent most of my life in Kabul with books and working to separate the knowledge. Because the only thing can save us as an Afghan and also save the world. Because now, the consequences of war is feeling in the UK, in the United States, and all over the world. This dirty war is very dangerous. As much as I separate knowledge and books, uh, this is very useful for them. Uh, as you said, I was very brave during my book selling. Uh, during the Mujahideen government, during the Civil War, in my bookstore in Continental Hotel, I had many, many uh, translation of uh, books have been written by foreigners uh, in Pakistan, Urdu and English and German, French. I had all books from everywhere. Even Mr. David Lyne's books was in my bookstore. Very pleased to hear. And uh, Pashto edition is also with us. And uh, I had in, in the collection, there was a book, uh, How to Solve Your Sexual Problems in Persian language. One of the ministers at that time came and go around, see and browsing the shelves, and came back and pick up that book, and came to the counter to pay, and asked me, how is your business? I told him, I have 99 titles from 100 on Afghan politics, how to solve Afghan problems, and one sexual problems, and the, lead, the men who should read the politicians, the still they have, they have their sexual problems. And what did he? What was his answer? He was very madly angry, <laughs> and I was scared, very badly scared. And he put back the book and uh, went out. And after a few minutes, he came back, said, "You're right. Which book you recommend?" Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so I was very happy at that. And uh, so this is one example. 
I always, one day I remember three diplomats from uh, Saudi Arabia came to my bookshop. Uh, Mrs. Osna Thought was also sitting beside me. Uh, she was the she, Norwegian. She, she wrote the, the yeah the Norwegian uh, 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 caused all sorts of trouble. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, I told to the, those Arab diplomats with their Arab costumes, uh, "Can I ask you a questions?" He said, "Yes." Uh, can you promise to not be become angry? He said, no, we will never angry. <laughs> and uh, they gave their hands. Uh, you uh, can ask uh, all questions. I, look, I showed him from the window of my bookshop. This huge university is made by Russian Polytechnic University in the downtown, mm. uh, the, uh, in the skirts of uh, Continental Hotel Mountain. This is built by Russian, and Kabul University is built by American, and also a very modern uh, Istiklal High School attached with the Royal Palace built by French, and another school by uh, Germans, and Oriano Hotel uh, near Wazir Akbar Khan, and the poor Indian made uh, children's hospital, Indira Gandhi Hospital in Afghanistan. And again, the Chinese made a very large uh, hospital in uh, Kandahar and many other countries. Why we, as an Afghan uh, Muslims, have nothing from Saudi Arabia? It was a very sharp criticize to the ambassador of Saudi Arabia in Afghanistan. He said we help a lot to Afghans, but I say as an intellectual, I see nothing there. So. My job was to uh, send the message to the high-ranking people, to the press, and it was very successful. And the minister who purchased how to solve the sexual problem, I told him, don't worry, even Bill Clinton has a sexual scandal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, yeah. Sa of course, Saudi Arabia, you have got, Saudi Arabia has given you something. It's given you Wahhabi Just they ideology. Just donated That's some uh, all, dates. They all they've donated given you is ideology, yeah, which they, the Taliban have, uh, are employing yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in, in Afghanistan. Even we don't have a great mosque like a mosque, uh, Faisal Mosque in Islamabad, a very large, uh, made by Saudi <laughs> Arabia. We never have such things in Afghanistan, in Kabul. Uh, so this was... Uh, uh, job I was doing, it was not only a bookseller, but also to send the message to the important people. And I was a watchman during all 50 years. I visited lots of spies. I visited lots of uh, good people. I visited lots of uh, very, very good, uh, sympathetic uh, foreign friends. I, I visited uh, Osama bin Laden in Continental Water. I visited uh, uh, Hamid Gul, ISI chief <laughs> in Continental Water. And uh, I was eyewitness with all regimes because mainly I was staying in Kabul and doing business. And uh, <clears throat> How do you see the future of Afghanistan? And, and Perhaps, you know, what, what can we do? I mean, you mentioned the military intervention, and of course, n no one from the West is going to be involved in a military intervention in Afghanistan. But what, I mean, if you were advising the, the, the American government, the British government, the French government, the, the, the governments that sort of care about Afghanistan in the West, what would you say? Uh, I think uh, they should, American and British people and European people, they should solve their own problem first. <laughs> because they are faced a lot of problems, because war, war is very expensive. Now, now the war is in Europe, a dangerous war. They are talking about nuclear bombs, they are talking about dirty bombs, and they are talking about recession. I mean, do you, do you recession. think the Taliban have the capacity to ignore us, in a way, because of our problems? Because they see, you know, Trump, Biden, the sort of weakness in America, they see you know, a uh, certain dysfunction in this country, you know, four, four, th th three prime ministers a year, you know, all that sort of thing. Uh, the Taliban, uh, as an Afghan, they are uh, intelligent in their own Afghan way, and they have been educated in Pakistani madrasas, and they taught the cheating 
diplomacy from ISI and from Pakistanis. They are very, very talented how to cheat the United States and uh, make them fool to do their own. I remember when uh, Hamid Gul made some uh, mistakes and the United States government was criticizing Hamid, Hamid Gul. Hamid was the Pakistani, Pakistani spy who originally yeah, yeah. sort of he was, was one important. of the founders of the Taliban in the 1990s. And next day he appeared with a necktie, suited very luxury like Americans and European diplomats. Then he was talking. I said, look at this man. Mainly he wear a pakol like Mujahideen, a pair with waistcoat, and now with necktie, he wants to cheat again in the United States. It's, I, I told a joke to Mr. David Lyne just a few minutes before. Uh, Mullah Nasruddin was uh, telling that I am able to teach a donkey singing songs. So this news uh, separated uh, to the air of Amir Timur Lane. And Amir Timur called Mullah Nasruddin. Tim, Timur Lane is Timur Lane. Yeah, yeah. The, um, the, An um, Timur empire Lain. of Central Asia and uh, Timur at uh, time around 700 years before. I yeah. don't know exactly the exact date. And he called Mullah Nasruddin, how you can teach the donkey? Is it true? He said, yes, it's true. I need a very big bag of gold and then a very young and good breed donkey. And then number three, I need 10 years of time. Amir Temur was fooled and uh, he gave him 10 years time. And he gave him the bag of gold. A bag of gold and with a very good high quality donkey. And he came uh, in luxury clothes to his village. His village man saw Mulad Nasruddin is very rich and he has a very expensive, uh, like limousine car, donkey. And uh, they came to his house and said, how you are become so rich? He said that this is the story. They said that Mr. Timur is very dangerous. He will scan up your, your body. You take off your skin. He is very dangerous. It's impossible for you to uh, teach a donkey to sing song. And Amir Timur said, Mulan uh, Nasruddin said, you are stupid. In 10 years, I have 10 years time, either I will die, or the donkey, or Amir Temur. <laughs> in 10 years. All contracts, on contr all contracts with uh, Taliban, with Pakistan, is exactly based on this story. Because in the uh, United uh, States, the presidency time is only four years, if they are lucky, they can continue another four years. And after Bush, Obama will not ask about the contract have been signed between Karzai or between that. And, and Trump signed a uh, contract with Taliban and, uh, in the middle of the uh, negotiation and talks. Trump was not on the power. As, so, yeah, well, perhaps it was, perhaps it was yeah, Afghanistan's yeah. problem that President Biden did honor that contract beyond the yeah. administration and pull the troops out so quickly mm. last, last summer. I want to bring the audience in with some, some questions, which I'm sure are here. Um, uh, I should just say um, uh, Shah M, as I will always call him, since it's the bookshop, um, uh, uh, has his book, which is a riposte to the bookseller of Kabul. Um, it's a sort of dreamlike book um, uh, about um, his experiences um, uh, living with a Norwegian journalist, um, in a sense. It's sort of the other, the other side of the story. Um, any, any hands? Any, have we got a microphone somewhere? Any thoughts from the, from the, from the audience? Um, in this, and give pe keep people a chance to... Or we'll, or we'll carry on chatting. We'll carry on chatting, unless, but if, catch my eye and we'll, oh yes, there's one there. Hello. Thanks, hi, Shah. Um, yeah. I just wonder, what's your dream to do with books? <laughs> if you could do anything with books in the world, what's your dream to see for kind of the world with books? Oh, it's, uh, sometimes I, I think that uh, I am, they call me bookseller of Kabul, actually I'm book lover. I cannot leave this. I can't leave both of my wives, but I never can leave my books. <laughs> I never. I love it because I found definition for the book after 50 years. 
what is a book? We have individual dreams, uh, brains, your brain, my brain, Boris Johnson brain, and Prophet Jesus and Muhammad brain. We have one human brain, and the book is simply a gate to the human brain. If you open a book, actually we open a door, a window to the human brain, and human brain have capacity to answer all our questions and solve all our problems. This is the definition of book. I will never leave it because it's the only way to get inside the human brain and solve our questions. Now here is a question a friend asked me last week. Uh, why we cannot solve very small problems like uh, in Ukraine? Why we couldn't solve? You say the brain, human brain, have solution for everything. But I say the people who enter in the brain, they are very unqualified, very, very unqualified. Mm. And they cannot have the capacity to go there. And the people who understand the solution, no one listens to them. So that's we a political problem. But I, mean, yeah, I, suppose behind, we have, uh, I suppose behind your question is, you know, it, it, what's your dream with books? You know, if you could do anything with books, yeah. you know, uh, with given all the money available and, and the political you know, will, what would it, what would it be? Uh, no, I, 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 I'm not that rich as well, uh, but I'm rich of books, not rich of money. I, I live all my life very simply. Uh, I, I don't have a dream to build an empire for myself. Just I have a dream to uh, provide opportunity to the people to read, to see and find their sol solution for their problems. Especially in Afghanistan, we have lots of problems, lots of problems, ethnic problems, economic problem, everything. And the only way we can overcome all those problems is the books to read and to... What's it like living without them? I mean, you're here in an asylum seekers hotel mm. and you say, you know, you run your business with this, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But what's, what's it like not being in the Aladdin's cave? You must miss it. Uh, no, I, I, I don't miss, I'm not uh, too far from my books every day. When I'm here in the library, it was a great dream for, dream for me. Like uh, the lover's, lover's tale, Laili Majnoon. And uh, Laili was a daughter of uh, an empire, a king, and Majnoon was mad and fall in love with that. When I'm in the British Library, actually, I'm with uh, my lover, Alice. <laughs> and uh, here I feel very, very good and very close. And uh, every day I am reading books, I am talking with people, and I am guiding people, and I am uh, very active in uh, Afghan media. I have good discussions with them and uh, very good shows. And uh, 200, just one show I made, and I explained the main problem of Afghanistan. And uh, over 200,000 viewers viewed this uh, show uh, in one week, just in one week. Uh, I am with books, I never... So the main problem with Afghanistan, what's the main solution for Afghanistan? Uh, as I told you, when uh, the solution uh, is in uh, Washington, D.C., and European NATO forces, when they solve their problem, probably Afghanistan will very soon, will, the changes will appear. You saw when the Taliban, at the first stage, with the first stage, Taliban was toppled and was defeated. It was only a few days, a few weeks. And uh, again, because the world decided to do this. The problem in Afghanistan is not an Afghan problem. It's a problem in old, old geopolitics. We had Great Game 1, which has passed, and now we are in Great Game 2. Again, we should give uh, another 100,000 lives lost. During 20 years, uh, more than 10,000 European and American soldiers have been killed, and more than 20,000 have been injured. 
but for Afghanistan, it was a very big mess. Over 100,000 have been killed, over uh, 500,000 disabled and injured, mm -hmm. over a million people were affected by this war. And many people have lost their homes and their country. There's one yeah. here and then, and then one at the back. Yeah, so one here first. Yeah. With the, yeah. And then you, sir. Shah, you've now been an asylum seeker in this country for about a year. It's very restrictive. It's lovely to see your daughters managed to visit you today. <laughs> but when you get an asylum, when you become a refugee, what are you going to do then? What, what will you do when you're free to make your own choices and determine your own life? Uh, when the problems in the UK has been solved, then my problem will be solved easily. They have lots of problems now facing with Ukraine and refugees and other. And uh, more than one year I'm here, I have received nothing from the Home Office. I'm waiting. When I receive uh, their decision, it's positive. So definitely I will open an Afghan study center uh, in London and also a bookshop in London. Probably it will be the world's largest bookstore <laughs> from many, many languages. I have the capacity because I have collected over 20,000 titles of books on Afghanistan in many languages. And uh, uh, I have the capacity to open such a bookshop in London. And uh, this is my dream. And uh, also my family reconciled with their third my third wife and camp to be and around me. I have a large family, nine children and three daughter-in-laws and four grandchildren. And One at the back. It's a wonderful idea and I'm sure yeah. you'll do it. Hello everyone. I um, want you to Mr. do it back Shah in Kabul. Welcome right? to here. My yeah. name is Shazia. I'm also an Afghan. I just, uh, I just want to know, as uh, you have been se selling books for many years, uh, so you know better that how Afghans love to learn and to get education. Could you please a bit explain that? Because uh, I know that some people may, they think that Afghan people don't have interest with education and with learnings, which is wrong. So could you tell me about that? Because you have seen so many people that they have came to your workshop and uh, for buying uh, books. And you have talked with so many people in Afghanistan and you know better that how Afghans are thirsty for education and uh, for learning. Uh, just uh, just uh, allow me to explain my question in there as well. Uh, uh, no, I, I took your uh, language. Yeah, but, uh, okay, but please. Uh, شما یک کمی را واضح بسازید به خاطر که بعضی مردم واقعا فکر میکنند که افغان ها مردم جنگ زده هستند قدر دیگه علاقه به درس و تعلیم ندارند شما خود سالهای زیاد کتاب فروختین میفهمید که چقدر افغان ها گشنه و تشنه تحصیل هستند میشه لطفا اونمو بخش هم یک تشریح کنین تا مردم بفهمند که افغان ها هم دوست دارند که تحصیل کده باشند دوست دارند که مطالعه کنند Thank you so much Thank you uh, when you asked me this question, I remember a story, a real story. Uh, there was a man from Switzerland, his name was Peter Stalker. He was the head of uh, ICRC. Hmm. And same question he asked me, uh, how Afghans have interest in reading or not. And, uh, uh, I told him, what do you think? Uh, uh, he gave me a story. Actually, this story I've been told uh, one, by one of my relatives. There was an illiterate Afghan chief in uh, Zabul province, southeastern province of Afghanistan. And uh, he was illiterate. He never have been in school and a, a delegate of nine uh, foreigners and one Afghan translator uh, wanted to visit this chief and uh, ask either the aid from United Nations is coming here properly and distributed uh, justicefully or not. 
And this chief uh, called him, you are welcome, you can come to my house and we will talk. And when he came, uh, you know, when the guest room in the provinces, in the town, in the village, there is uh, the Maliks and the chiefs have, like me, many children and many wives they have. And the crowd on the door side, they were standing. When the foreigners came and called one of uh, his men from the door side, uh, door, and he came and said something to his hair, and he went and brought 11 cans of Pepsi. And the chief uh, told the man, put each uh, one can of Pepsi in front of each guest and one cup of Pepsi in front of translator and one cup of Pepsi in front of me. And they distributed the 11 can of Pepsi. And when the first question was asked from that Afghan chief, uh, either the aid is coming properly and distributed justice fully or not, he said, yes, you are very satisfied. As a chief, I am very, very satisfied with your aid. And the delegate asked, can you explain how? He said, Yes, just exactly like the cans of Pepsi. When you send 11 cans of Pepsi, nine is for yourself back, one for Afghan translator and one for me because I'm a chief. <laughs> and the rest of the people, Afghan, they say the color of the Pepsi, can of the Pepsi, uh, blue and red lines, and they don't know the test inside. So this is the most intelligent answer for crafted United Nations aid program, in especially in Afghanistan and war-torn countries. But it doesn't quite answer the question of to why do Af why, what, what do yeah, Afghans... I, I'm coming to yes, this the question. <laughs> Think about you it. Also explain it's elliptical sense. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Afghans are very, very talented. I purchased a set of books when Pakistan and Afghanistan. I'm explaining because it's a very important question. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, a little bit in detail. I purchased a set of books, Shah Jahan Omar, uh, a history of Shah Jahan, Empire of Mughal in India. And the introduction of every new book I find, I read the introduction. The author of this book was Saleh Muhammad Kambu. Kambu. And the uh, man who had wrote the introduction, he was explaining who is Kambu. Uh, the meaning of Kambu is less smell or less perfumed or something like this. And uh, he, fo he had found, quoted a poem. Agar qahtur rijal uftat azin se uns kamgiri, yaki afghan doom Kambu se yum bazate kashmiri. If there is the lack of leadership, good leadership, please avoid contacting these three ethnics. One, Afghan, the Patans, the second, Kambu, the third, Batsati Kashmiri, the Kandrel Kashmiris. So this point means that Afghans are the most intelligent people, the mo best people in the world, if they have good leadership and Afghans are the worst people of the world if they don't have good leadership. When the problem in our leadership, in our society is solved, Afghans are very, very intelligent. We have talented, number six talent in the Microsoft, in the internet, in the computer science is an Afghan, he's a Canadian Afghan, his name is Abdul Hay, one of our relatives. And uh, Nurahman Lewal, uh, is an Afghan Patan who was uh, amazing uh, inventions in computer science. There are lots of Afghans, they love books, they read books. Even the Patans, they love books. They have translated uh, 8,000 poems of Shah Nami Ferdowsi into Pashto uh, 150 years before. But uh, unfortunately, we don't have good leadership. One at the front. Sorry, there's a microphone there, if you wait for that. Thank you. Hello, Sean. Um, first of all, I'd like to apologize on behalf of 
my country for the terrible devastation and destruction that we've brought on Afghanistan. Uh, not in my name, I hasten to add, in the name of most people in the country. But it's absolutely appalling and we're very, most of us are very, very ashamed of what's happened. Um, but my question is, are there any books that you refuse to sell or will not sell? It's a good question. Yeah, yeah, many religious books I refuse. I never uh, have sold those books, though they had good market. One was about the paradise, heaven, and uh, hell. They give very, very <laughs> dirty uh, explanation of heaven and Islam and religious and this and that and that. I never said. But according to your questions, your country was very good in a, in a way. They made infrastructures in Pakistan and India, uh, but also in Afghanistan. They wrote the grammar of Pashto language, a uh, most difficult language by Robert E. and uh, by others. And a team of uh, ethnographers, uh, a team of uh, everyone, they studied the birth of Afghanistan. They created a huge uh, uh, number of literature uh, about Afghanistan, uh, about our country. And uh, other books I never uh, found to be bad. All of them were good. I have uh, a wide selection of books I've written by the British forces. There's a curious um, obsession in South Asia, in, in India and, pa and Pakistan, and indeed in Afghanistan, in the street markets. One of the most popular titles in Pakistan at airport bookstores is Mein Kampf, mm -hmm. um, um, Hitler's um, um, uh, message to his people. Do, do you stock Mein Kampf? No, never. Never. I, I, I don't believe in the... Uh, I am a very liberal Muslim. I love books and philosophy of Islamic civilization, like Avicenna, like Rumi, like this. Mm. Uh, they are very different. Uh, as I talked with you before, there was uh, a compulsory curriculum of every madrasa from four South Asian countries, Malaysia, Indonesia, India, to Turkey, Central Asia, everywhere. There was five treasures or Panj Ganj. And those books have been taught for centuries in madrasas. Every mullah, every uh, religious clergy, sh uh, if they didn't finish read those books, they never got their certificate. Those books were Saadi's books. Saadi, you know, Saadi uh, is, is poem is the manifest of United Nations. Uh, it has I've been engraved in many languages in the United Nations Hall. That humanity is like a body. The hand is Afghan, the finger is an Afghan, the head is an American. And if a part of, uh, a small part of your finger is pain, all your body will feel the pain. So this not only produced clergy with religious thoughts, but also with wisdom of human, humanity and honesty and love of the human being. Because Rumi book was the second one, and Khawja Dulansari was the third one, and five books, I forgot the fifth one. Uh, you know, because uh, and Rumi, then those books, Rumi loved... Those, those uh, books are no longer taught. The, yeah, yeah, taken six out of, years, when they took out, out, out the, curriculum. the Islam f uh, f uh, feature had completely changed and replaced with the thoughts of Ikhwan al muslimin from Egypt, Wahhabis from Saudi Arabia, and uh, Osama bin Laden's master, uh, Abdullah Izzam, uh, books was replaced. Uh, and that, so that, that coarsened the madrasa yeah, the, uh, sort of thinking. No, the, the Afghan thinking. mullahs and the Taliban, they are students of uh, fundamentalist and extremist terrorism uh, teachers they have. 
Yeah, so many people, many people here would, of, of those authors would certainly have encountered Rumi probably as a, as a poet mm -hmm. um, and, and, and regard him. Mm -hmm. uh, are you able now under the Taliban in control in Afghanistan to sell, for example, Rumi openly in your bookshop? Uh, no, it's not permitted to sell them. They call, even the Persian language, they are against Persian language. On the news, you hear every time that they remove the, even the signboards of the hospitals from the universities. When it's written in Persian, they remove it and replace it with Pashto. And Pashto language is very, very poor in literature. The value of languages are same. Persian, English, or uh, Pashto, it's the same for their own people, their mother language. They call it mother language, which is very holy. But uh, capacity and quality is different. Persian language is a language of a very large civilization. Rumi says, burn Kaaba and Medina and uh, never pray. Do this, this. Just keep faith in your heart and love others, love people. He teaches love and wisdom. But if you had Rumi in the front window, the, the Taliban would come and take it out. Uh, fortunately, they don't understand. They cannot read. <laughs> uh, in my bookshop, when they are in Royal Palace now, when they come out, first they see Afghanistan Bank, which is full of dollars. And this sign attracts them. And they cannot understand there is a bookshop and there have been <laughs> and this and that. So, yeah. Yeah, so, it's a long question, long answer to the sort of banned books question. I'm going to ask Dowd at the back, who's my former BBC colleague, to come in. Um, uh, to, uh, can you to, talk about educated Afghans? He's got a PhD. Um, wh wh what, is, wh what do you think of Afghanistan now and the answer to some of these questions about education going forward and Shah M's contribution to your country? Well, uh, thank you, David, uh, for your question. I think Mr. Shah answered uh, most of the questions. So I just wanted to mention a couple of points about Afghanistan in the past. Uh, it was uh, an empire many times in the past. So there was culture, there was civilization. Most of the cities in Afghanistan today were uh, capitals of regional empires. Ghazni was the capital of Ghaznavid Empire. Ghor, again, another province of Afghanistan, was the capital of uh, Ghorid Empire. And Kandahar was the capital of the Durrani Empire. So again, Kabul was a great center of civilization and culture. There were uh, educational centers, there were madrasas. Balkh was one of the biggest centers of Buddhism in the past. Kandahara civilization, before Islam came to that region, um, emerged in what is now eastern Afghanistan. And uh, actually, uh, it was the center of Mahayana Buddhism. And before that, Zoroastrianism. So there are many layers, um, history and culture and civilization. So it's a once a great cultural, educational, yeah. civilizational hub. And the ge uh, I hesitate to say what happened wi wi without giving you an, about an hour to answer it. But yeah, so the geographical location made it important. So it made Afghanistan as uh, the center of civilization and culture and a major center of uh, education. Um, again, Sufism. Uh, many of the great Sufis of the Muslim world were from Afghanistan. I mean, you mentioned Rumi, Maulana Jalaluddin Balkhi Rumi. He was born in Balkh, in North Afghanistan. Uh, Khwaja Abdullah Ansari, again, another great Sufi of Islam, uh, is buried in Herat. The greatest uh, Sufi of South Asia, Khwaja Muhyiddin Chishti, who is buried in India, in Ajmer, was yeah. from Chisht in Herat. And Ibrahim ibn Adam was again from Balkh in, uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan, one of the greatest Sufis of Islam. Again, many poets and I from Ghazni. And how does, but how nowadays is education and book selling going to be able to turn back so that some Afghans can see some of this extraordinary culture given how much their life has been coarsened by the, the current government? I mean, the irony is, as you said earlier, that Afghanistan was destroyed many times. So they rebuilt their lives, another invasion came. So it's very unusual that uh, over the past 
two centuries, three superpowers of the world invaded Afghanistan. It didn't happen anywhere in the world. Mm. So the British Empire, Soviet Union, NATO and the US, so all of these great powers fought in Afghanistan within a short uh, span of time. And that's why Afghanistan is unique when it comes to geography, when it comes to location. It, it's a curse and it's also a blessing. So whenever there is an opportunity, whenever there was an opportunity, people rebuild their lives. Look at the past 20 years when people found opportunity, uh, there were universities within just a few years. I mean, you were there, you saw uh, 20 years ago, there, was, uh, there were just a couple of universities. So within 10, 15 years, there were more than 20 universities. So if there is opportunity, people want to get education, and people will tell you stories. I mean, you have been to many villages in Afghanistan about great scholars um, whose shrines are visited by people, whose books or sayings are remembered by people, and they mention them in their gatherings. So the point is that uh, it can uh, regain their status, uh, but it needs peace and stability. Are you optimistic, Shah? Uh, I'm very optimistic because uh, everything has a capacity. Can the world uh, resist on all these recessions and crises and problems? Can United States people uh, uh, agree with the gov their government and British people agree there with governments that to continue war or start the Third World War, which will be very dangerous? I think everything, uh, I'm very optimistic, will not happen in future bad things. And very soon we will have good news about the solution of problems in Middle East and Afghanistan because we shall, be, shall be Afghan owned this time. Yeah, yeah. Because now it is very close to the boiling, boiling point. And uh, 100 degree is the last stage to boil. And uh, we are very close. Can yeah, I ask you can... a last question, I, and then we'll, 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 mm. we'll, we'll stop and sell books and have a drink and all the rest of it, mm. um, um, which is a conceptual one, really. I wonder if we, we can ever understand. I'm struck talking to you for an hour um, about how many questions you answer with a story, with a story about a, you know, teaching a donkey to sing, with a story of, mm. of, of uh, you know, there's a, there's a very imaginative, poetic, cultural history, as we heard from Dowd. And I think, um, you know, I saw Americans over the last 20 years, you know, who are very procedural and transactional in the way that British are, actually. So going in very straight and saying, one, two, three, this is what I want. Um, and the, of course, you know, Afghans, you know, you go to Afghan meetings and they can go on for, you know, several hours. Um, and the, 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 the ask is actually while you're putting your coat on. Um, you know, you don't quite know why you're in the room. And then as you leave, there's this, just by the way. Um, and you've heard lots of stories along the way. And, you know, and of course, you know, symbolic tales of, you know, the 11 cans of Pepsi and all that. Great, a very great image, a sort of abiding image of, 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 of aid, in a sense. Um, I, wonder, I suppose my question is, you know, can we ever sort of get on? Can we understand each other, given our quite linear, transactional relationship with the world? I think uh, we have uh, lots of understanding since 20 years I found. There were lots of good foreigners. They were supporting Afghanistan from the bottom of their hearts. And they worked a lot. They created lots of good things in Afghanistan. One of their examples was uh, the Oina uh, Institute for Free Journalism. It was established with the assistance of Ahmad Rashid from Pakistan, Reza Dekati from Iran, and uh, Edward, Edward Girardet Edward Jordan, yeah. from uh, UK, and many French people. And they gave hand together and uh, trained and uh, gave graduation for very, very talented Afghans. One of those Afghans was my brother, who was assassinated with his family wife in two children in uh, 2014 in Serena Hotel, and Harun Najafizadeh and Lutfullah Najafizadeh. They are very, very talented people. It was, uh, the world, I think, will never forget these things. 
And we, the people of the world in Afghanistan, we have lots of mutual interest, and we have understanding very clearly. Unfortunately, the top, the problem is on the top. Few people, like I told you the story of Timur Lan, uh, who captured his rival uh, king, when they brought the rival king to him, he, he had one eye, he was missing. He la laughed very loudly when he fell down from his horseback, laughing, and said, look at this creature, like a sly uh, fox. He is master of the destiny of millions of people, and I disable with one leg, and he disable with one eye. We decide on the destiny of millions. Just few people are deciding on our destinies. Well, let's hope we can get yeah. some different ones in the future quite mm. soon. We'll, 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 <laughs> we'll stop there. And um, my book, The Long War, um, which tells the story of the last 20 years, um, is available on a QR code, and it'll be delivered online um, for free, as, as I understand. And Shah has, sensibly enough, brought a bag of books with him, so they, they can be <laughs> physically, physically sold. But otherwise, I'll just um, say thank you very much to Shah Mohammed Rice, thank you bookseller of Kabul. Thank you very much. Are you going to say something? Thank you so much for that wonderful speech. Um, I would just like to say how affecting it is to, to, ha to welcome someone into the British Library who's led such an extraordinary life and been such an advocate for books and for literacy. Um, I hope you'll all show your appreciation by buying the book, which is available here. Um, it's a cash only um, £10, it's a very good bargain. And uh, we have a cash <laughs> point, very conveniently located right here within the British Library, so <laughs> you have no excuse. And David, as, of course, as an extremely distinguished and experienced journalist of the BBC. His book is outstanding and that's also available but in the ether. So you just need to point your phones at that QR code and it will be delivered to you free. Um, one last clap for our brilliant speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move. Right. Thankful uh, from the British Library that gave me this opportunity to talk with you. And it's a very big honor for me. Today is uh, uh, un an unforgettable day for me. Thank you so much for this. Thank you so much, Mr. David Lang.